Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McBacon, executive editor with the Mises Institute. And with me is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And we're joined today by one of our senior fellows, Mark Thornton. And if you're a regular reader of Radio Rothbard, you know all about Mark. Uh, he also has two podcasts now of his own with the Mises Institute, one of which is called Minor Issues. And that is a short form podcast that he does. And I very much recommend that if you just like a nice five minute podcast that's covering an important aspect of the economy. And he's also covering some more fundamental issues as well in a longer form podcast called the Unanimity Podcast. And his latest one is on the minimum wage. Uh, so you can go to our page at Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G, click on podcasts and you can find all of that there. Now, before we get on to the discussion, I also just want to make sure and mention that we're in the middle of a book giveaway right now. We're giving away 100,000 copies of Murray Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money? This is a great primer on money. What is it on business cycles, on inflation? Where does it come from? What causes stagflation? All of those issues, as well as gold and what is good money. And, uh, if you, and it's also mercifully short. So if uh, you'd like a book of that nature for free, and you can also get multiple copies if you have a, say, a, a club or a, a reading of a group of some kind that you'd like to just give everyone copies of their own, you can get all that free from our site. That's M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G slash Rothpod free. Then you just fill out the form and tell them how many copies you want. Uh, and uh, so we've still got, I don't know, over 80,000 left, I think. It's not a very old campaign at this point. Um, so make sure and do it. This It's not an endless uh, amount that's available. All right. Well, to the discussion, I wanted to have Mark on this week, uh, really, because it's been at least six weeks, I think, since we had last on. And uh, I want to just cover some of the economic issues that are going on right now. And, and what prompted this to some extent is the fact that uh, another jobs report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics came out on Friday. And I think we've all become kind of used to the routine that generally accompanies the release of one of these reports uh, over the past year. So it's usually, not always, but usually uh, the the establishment survey, that is a survey of large employers, shows big job gains. And then the Washington Post, CNN, the Biden administration all tell us how red hot and amazing the economy is but buried deep in that data, actually not even that deep, it's pretty easy to find if you actually care to look, is data on the household survey, which is the number of actually employed persons, not the number of jobs. That's considerably less wonderful if uh, you're in the job market right now. In fact, while the uh, most recent report showed a gain of about 270,000 jobs. The household survey showed a loss of more than 400,000 workers. And so what you've got are most likely what this shows is you've got a lot of people who are getting second jobs. You've got a situation where uh, we haven't in 11 months haven't had more workers added to the economy. What we've had is more jobs added, according to assuming the establishment survey is even correct. And I think this is really just part of just a, a larger issue of what we need to be looking at when we're looking at economic trends is looking beyond any single number that happens to be featured in the headlines. And uh, this also has started to filter into even some of the mainstream commentary as well on the economy. For example, Bloomberg's chief economist, Anna Wong, uh, was quoted saying that she doesn't think the establishment survey really reflects the larger reality of the economy anymore. She was looking at the birth death model, which is this these made up numbers that they use to estimate the number of new business creations and the number of jobs created by those. These aren't based on actual surveys. It's just a guess. And that has really propped up the, num the total number of jobs. And she was saying, well, actually, I don't think it's 270,000. I think it's more like under 100,000 is what we're looking at. That is a huge swing, of course. And when we look at the larger economy, some of the larger issues, and just what, as Austrian economists, if we know what is going on uh, in terms of the business cycle, it's pretty hard to come to the conclusion that everything's great and this is a historically wonderful economy, as the Biden administration says. And so, Mark, uh, 
I'm going to send it over to you. I mean, what <laughs> when you see these headlines of just how just amazingly historic uh, and how wonderful the the job market is and just the economy in general, I mean, what's your reaction to that? What 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 are some of the things you think about in terms of okay, well, maybe the larger picture tells us something different. Well, actually, I like the larger picture that more jobs are being created, but when you look below that headline number, uh, things are not looking good at all. Uh, the number of unfilled jobs or job openings is down. Um, you know, one of the things that's keeping the headline number looking good is the number of people fu getting fired is uh, stable and fairly low because primarily employers are reluctant uh, to give up the labor that they have uh, given the shortages of labor that they experienced over the last couple of years. And then, of course, the number of good breadwinner jobs um, is stagnant or non-existent. So, yes, the headline number is great. You know, it's great that um, they estimate the number of new jobs is increasing uh, at a their number is fairly normal, but below that number, uh, there's considerable weakness. And I think that's what was behind um, that economist estimation based on the birth uh, death rate of new businesses. Uh, given the high cost of capital right now, uh, that there probably isn't as many new businesses being created. And therefore, that, that leaves a hole. In, in the overall estimate of uh, jobs and undercuts that headline number, uh, the fact that there's no real breadwinner jobs being created, uh, that there's more part-time uh, second jobs or third jobs that people are taking, um, that really shows much more uh, or indicates much more uh, desperation on the part of the lower middle-class uh, uh, workers out there in the economy, that they're not, be, they're not being able to pay all their bills. Uh, they may be stretching their credit cards, and therefore, they're taking a second or third job. And uh, I mean, w looking at the business cycle overall, it's always hard. I mean, we here are not perma bears. In the, and I've actually, as editor, been very careful to not run a nonstop stream of articles <laughs> in my tenure, tenure, saying, oh, yes, everything's always bad. The data always shows the economy's terrible. Um, and uh, some of our best observers on that have been you and Brendan Brown uh, also, who have, have noted that, no, we're still... Uh, over the years, we're still in a boom phase. And you can see this in terms of money creation. You can see this in terms of wages being bidded up and those sorts of issues. And we recognize, of course, it's always difficult to guess where you are in the business cycle. Uh, but what, are you willing to venture just a guess as to where we are and, and what that would mean then for our wages still in the phase where they're being bid up? And because we do continue to see wage growth in the official numbers, it's, it's saying that wage growth is back to exceeding inflation or price inflation, CPI inflation, not monetary inflation. And where should we really, when we're looking at uh, trying to guess where we are in the business cycle, what, wh where are we? I like, are, are we still at the, are we in the latter stages of a boom phase? Uh, what would you speculate is going on there? Well, first of all, it's hard not to be uh, a perma bear. Uh, you know, when you take, for example, my skyscraper index, uh, you know, that's an indication that the economy is entering a boom phase. But then, of course, you're simultaneously worried about the next crisis coming down the road. <laughs> so there's always uh, a bear out there. Uh, that you have to be worried about whether or not you're in one or you're just anticipating the next one, that's what's really hard to tell. I would say 
that currently, as I've been thinking right along, uh, and I think the recent blow off movement in the stock market that we've seen uh, over the last six to eight months is a, is a good indication that we're at the end of uh, the bull market and that we're in a uh, blow off phase in the stock market and that the economy has certainly ripened uh, to the point where uh, a bear market is very soon to ensue. Um, everything seems to be lining up uh, in that direction. Uh, if you listen to stock market uh, commentators, uh, they've had earnings uh, to speculate with in terms of higher earnings by the major corporations uh, has helped fuel uh, the stock market higher, and uh, it has made people less worried about some of the underlying problems uh, of inflation and high interest rates, uh, those kind of negative things. But we're running low on uh, increased earnings, uh, and we're seeing uh, rising costs uh, of, of production and uh, rising costs in these corporations that the, that the stocks represent. Uh, we're also seeing a weakening consumer. And right now, of course, the stock market has been focused in on artificial intelligence. And in my mind, it's not really an estimate. It's more of a guesstimate that uh, the value of those stocks that are related to artificial intelligence that are related to the Magnificent Seven, uh, which have produced a lot of earnings, uh, but it's just my general view that the value of those stocks ha represents uh, a total return to the corporations themselves. In other words, the corporations are going to reap all of the benefits of artificial intelligence. But of course, that neglects the fact of things like costs and competition and the price for which they're going to be able to sell artificial intelligence and the cost of higher chip prices and all of the infrastructure infrastructure uh, that they've been talking about that's necessary to implement artificial intelligence. So like with the internet, uh, computer chips before that and all the various past cycles, uh, what we've seen is the value of the stocks of those corporations have been bid up to the point where the stock market thinks that those corporations are going to be able to reap every penny of value that they create. But we know um, that price really determines that. Uh, and if the price of those computer chips falls, yes, the consumer is going to get uh, a much bigger part of the benefit and the corporations are going to get less. Uh, the same thing with the internet, you know, that the internet companies and the internet retailers were going to get all of the benefit um, of, of those technologies. Uh, and it turned out that no, they didn't. And uh, that consumers benefited much more as a result of the falling price. And I think we're going to look back in a few years and see the same thing with artificial intelligence. It is going to be a tremendous boon uh, in the economy, but who gets the benefit? My money is on competition, um, the business cycle leveling things out, and the consumers are going to get a much bigger part of the pie relative to the corporations that sell those products uh, in the economy. So I, my bet is that we're on the cusp uh, of a very highly uh, valued stock market. Um, I, it's been my belief all along that it, about the election time or the end of the year, we should find ourselves in a real pickle in terms of the macro economy and that that would indicate that the, smart, the stock market is ripe uh, any day now, 
uh, but certainly I'm not predicting that, but it's uh, certainly set up uh, for uh, a revaluation. And uh, given the run-up in the stock market over the last many years, uh, there's a lot of room to fall back to previous levels. Well, let's look a, a little bit at uh, the skyscraper curse again, which you had, uh, which you had mentioned. And of course, that doesn't always manifest itself in just the height of a building, right? There can be, uh, as you've mentioned in, in some articles, we, we could be looking at terms of huge convention centers or other major public works that sometimes um, are very costly and might be an indication of the curse or the index, whatever you want to call it. And what I'm seeing now, of course, in a lot of uh, financial Twitter and uh, a lot of the discussion among uh, those sorts of people and the investment types is there's a lot of discussion about, of course, commercial real estate right now, which does, of course, touch on the issue of large buildings. Uh, and there have been some recent stories where you've got commercial buildings that are selling now for small percentages of what they had sold for, say, five years ago. And what does that mean then for, I mean, take it back to the stock market or to large investors who might have large portfolios, and also for banks who might have a lot of their portfolio in commercial real estate? Is is this something that we should be keeping our eye on as a, as a black swan trigger type of event? Or is this just something that's really uh, just one part of a much larger piece that's probably not going to really be the center of any sort of financial crisis or anything like that? Well, I will say that uh, the new record-setting skyscraper in the United States just got the clearance go ahead in Oklahoma City. Um, so that would indicate, you know, based on a naive interpretation of the skyscraper index that we're just now entering a boom phase uh, in the economy. Uh, but for a couple of reasons, I, I seriously doubt that. Um, in terms of the overall economy, we see the finance industry the banking industry, and as you've mentioned, the commercial real estate industry, um, not doing well at all. So typically, you, you see those sectors as an important component of any boom phase or expansionary phase uh, in the economy, and yet all three of those sectors are doing very poorly. Um, a second point I would bring up is that this project in Oklahoma City is just a United States uh, record proposal. Uh, it's not really uh, in the process of, you know, building that record uh, yet. And it's in a very tight industry uh, that's centered around oil and natural gas. So this may mean something to the effect that we might see a boom in oil and gas, uh, but not necessarily in the overall economy. Uh, other things about that project that I'm aware of so far is there doesn't seem to be any real technological leaps forward that would somehow permeate through the overall economy. So my expectations at this point is that this is not um, a true boom indicator uh, as far as we know of the project so far. Um, and like I said at the very beginning, the fact that finance and banking and commercial real estate are already uh, not doing well. Uh, commercial real estate is low. The banking indus industry is low. Uh, and the general finance sector is not doing all that great either suggests to me that we're not really uh, in that phase where we're revving up uh, in, the, in the economy. Uh, there's certainly no positive signs yet uh, in those sectors to indicate that that would be the case. Um, and then, of course, the finance and the stock market and all those 
type of sectors in the economy, they are really um, chomping at the bit uh, for the Fed to cut rates. Uh, you know, that, that seems to be their uh, almost a mania uh, trying to anticipate what the Fed is going to do. You know, what do the latest reports uh, uh, tell us in terms of tea leaves, in terms of how many cuts the Fed is going to make? Um, and there's really an, uh, an air of desperation, I think, uh, in the commentators that I've had a chance to listen to um, on the standard uh, mainstream financial media. Well, that seems to be r really what what is the underlying analysis, quote unquote, of every new CPI report, every new jobs report is how does this affect what the Fed will do, right? There's never a discussion of like larger market fundamentals or what does this tell us about the market overall? It's it's uh, a, a issue of, OK, well, so the job situation was was like this. So how many how many cuts is the Fed going to do in terms of the interest rate later this year? That's that's immediately where every news article goes to. The second half of every article is about Fed policy and how it relates then to uh, the job or CPI report. And also what's interesting is that it's topsy turvy, right? It's it's. It's it's reversed in the sense that good news is bad news. So every time there's a good jobs report in terms of, oh, look, a lot of new jobs were added, the stock market does badly because now they think, oh, well, there was a lot of job creations, so that means the Fed is going to stay tighter for longer. And that's bad for the stock market then is, is the interpretation. And then if the reverse is true and it's a bad jobs report or inflation is – uh, let's see, bad jobs report, how, what, what sort of inflation policy goes with that, that would be a low inflation situation, then um, it's believed that the Fed can then cut at that point. And so then the stock market does well. And so you have to think through, right? It's not, it's not oh, the economy's good, so the, the stock market's doing well sort of thing. It's, oh, the, the report tells us the economy's doing poorly, so now the stock market's doing well. And it's like you say, right? Because it's it's this mania about what is Fed policy. And it seems a totally different analysis than what else you were talking about in terms of how will some of these issues like AI affect earnings overall? It would seem like that would be a more important issue for discussion about where the market is headed. But it seems that everything just comes down to, oh, is, is the CPI high or low? And Oh, it's uh, and what does that mean about the Fed? So this it's like just the most shallow analysis imaginable, but it just seems that the only thing that matters now is what Fed policy is going to be. And just asking you to speculate again, then what do you think the Fed's going to do? I mean, I mean, these markets, they're constantly changing their opinion, right? The one report comes out and we decide, oh, well, there's going to be three cuts this year. Oh, it's a different report now this month from last month. So now we decided there's going to be no cuts this year. Um, what, looking at a, at a higher, more stable view of things, what, what do you think the, the Fed is actually going to do? And, and we're different at the Mises Institute, of course, because we look at the actual political implications of this as well. We're not just like looking at – we don't believe that the Fed looks at the market and makes this purely – the scientific decision based on pure economic science or something like that. But given all the – given the both the economic and the political realities, what do you think the Fed is likely to do uh, before Election Day, if anything – or is it saving its its plan for after election day, and then it's really going to take a more honest assessment of the economy? Well, that's a very good question, uh, and I don't know. Uh, you know, the the Fed is certainly aligned with uh, the Biden side of issues. I think that's pretty clear, uh, and they're aligned against. Uh, uh, President Trump and uh, his political uh, backing. Uh, so they would really have to be engaged in sort of a multi, a three level chess game here uh, to determine um, how all that works out. I think uh, because they don't want to seem political, they don't want to be cutting, 
you know, before the election. But I think, uh, generally speaking, beyond today's uh, CPI report, uh, I think that they're going to react uh, minimally before the election unless they're given an opportunity for very large and substantial cuts. In other words, if a crisis is brewing, they will respond um, in a very, very significant way. Um, I don't, if I had to bet, I would say that they're not going to respond to the CPI report today because despite what the media is twisting it as a great report, it's really not. I mean, it's a very, uh, they miss the estimates by a very small amount. And if it wasn't for a 4% decline in gasoline prices, um, you know, it would have been, it would have turned it from a uh, below the estimates to above the estimates. And, but the stock market and markets generally um, are taking that report in in this case and and spinning it in a positive direction. I don't think it's enough uh, for the Fed uh, to change their stance at this point. They could, uh, but I think that they're going to wait um, either until after the election uh, or in response to a significant development, which I actually discussed at the beginning of this interview where I thought, well, you know, the stock market is ripe for a very significant uh, decline. That's something that they would respond to. Uh, if, if you get a situation in the next couple of months where uh, the um, infl inflation reports uh, combined with a, a big uh, drop in the stock market and a worsening, uh, most importantly, of labor markets. And remember, you know, the, the unemployment rate bottomed, I think, at 3.3%, and we're now up to 4%. So we're, we're heading in, in the direction that the Fed wants. Uh, and we've indicated that the, the numbers are even weaker than that. So, you know, whereas market commentators will tell us that things don't change that much in the short run in the labor market, but indeed they can change significantly in the short run and have in the past uh, when you look at all of the numbers across the board. So that's really what I'm looking at is between now and election day, is there going to be a crisis that the Fed has to respond to and will they respond to it in a massive sort of way? And of course, the Fed, if, if, if the Fed had their, their way, right, I mean, the, the goal going into this year was to have cuts already. And they've had to delay this. They've had to put it off. Again, you know, now now the hope, the hope out there is, oh, well, September Oh well, you know, there's, there's still time for two cuts, right? They, there, there is still that desperation there. But the, you know, the, the Fed, if it had it its way, it would have been in an environment to have, have cut rates before this point. Um, again, and the, the inflationary problems that have just not gone away have have kind of forced their hand here in a way that um, yeah, I think is leaving a lot of people uncomfortable. And this is not, and then you, you, we talked about chips and, and AI and, and that whole sector as well. I mean, of course, you know, we we have this entire black swan, you know, geopolitical dynamic there on, you know, the, the, the Chinese situation with Taiwan is something that could immediately change every single calculation in a way that um, would completely, <laughs> when, when so much of the gains there, NVIDIA and things like that, um, it's, it's interesting because it, it seems that, you know, with, with the importance of AI and the in, in kind of the innovations in the tech sector for kind of, if you're painting the rosy picture there, right, AI is supposed to be that driver. And, and I think that perhaps rather than what we've seen, what we saw with the internet, rather than what we've seen with, with other industries in the past, the state is almost proactively trying to get their hands within that market, right? You know, it's, it's AI as a national security risk. AI needs this heavy, you know, multi-state environment. Uh, you know, Kissinger has been pound, was pounding this table for, for years before, for, before he died. You know, there, there is, there is, seems to be a, a desire for the state to be proactive 
and trying to interfere with some of these potentials for growth in the future that further clouds, again, the most rosiest picture that you can have, which is already not aligning well with the inflation situation. The Fed has not been able to, to get under wraps to the extent that they would like to. All of this, again, culminating in the, the, the joys of the political season, the uncertainty of, uh, I, 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 as you mentioned earlier, I don't think Jay Powell is looking forward to uh, serving under President Trump <laughs> for, for another no. two years or so. No, but uh, I think that's right. I, and, you know, Biden just announced more protectionist measures for artificial intelligence and, and has been uh, taking steps in that direction right along. Uh, but I think, you know, Jay Powell and the Fed, if we want to sort of rest back on their traditional game plan, is that they are reluctant to, to change. If things are moving forward, uh, they're reluctant to adjust. Like, you know, most markets adjust on a daily basis and the Fed doesn't want to touch the market that much. What they prefer to do is to see an exogenous change be labeled as the cause of a crisis situation. Uh, so that could be, you know, anything under the sun, including war, protectionist wars, um, you know, a collapse in an individual market, collapse in the stock market. They want an exogenous, uh, at least something seen as exogenous to their influence, that they respond to that and are kind of like the white knight coming to the rescue. That's the way they want it perceived in the economy. And therefore, that makes them even more reluctant to make uh, marginal moves in the meantime. Well, to uh, as kind of our final part of this, I, I wanted to get both your reactions on uh, a, a letter dated two days ago from Elizabeth Warren. Um, and also Jackie Rosen, who's apparently a U.S. senator. I <laughs> haven't been keeping up, I guess. Uh, but it's a it's a letter from senators Warren and Rosen, and uh, it's to Chairman Powell and uh, dated June 10th. And this is what it says. We write today to urge the Fed to cut to the federal funds rate from its current two decade high of five point five percent. And so that's an interesting political situation right there. We got senators lobbying the Fed to cut the uh, to cut the federal funds rate, and and then it, she includes just some of the worst economic analysis ever. Uh, but what you would expect from the regime, uh, first of all, she says the sustained period of high interest rates is already slowing the economy. Um, okay, well, I mean, one could argue that, but then she says uh, is it is also this high interest rate. Is is high, quote unquote, is failing to address the remaining key drivers of inflation. So, what's her answer? Is to cut the rate further, right? I mean, it's <laughs> the reason it's not addressing the issue is it's not a very high rate. But of course, she doesn't want to to uh, admit that. Uh, and then she she then says, oh well, the ECB, the European Central Bank, they they have they have lower rates. They're not raising them as high. So you guys must be wrong. Uh, it's time for the Fed to do what the ECB is doing, and and then goes on to say uh, that the that the Fed's monetary policy is it's actually driving up housing and auto insurance costs. Uh, not and she's not referring to the Fed's monetary inflation of the last twenty years. She's referring to the Fed's higher interest rates that it's allowing the, to the interest rates that the Fed is allowed to go up a little bit. She's saying, "Oh, well, that's actually driving up housing and auto insurance costs. So it's time to cut rates so we can get uh, we can get housing prices back down again." And it's really quite remarkable. I don't know if she really thinks that Powell would is going to read this or care, or if she's just writing this as something she can show to her constituents. But I just find it is a very interesting example of what this discussion is between the Fed and prominent members of uh, the U.S. government, at least the elected members. Uh, and it, it basically just turning everything we know about Fed policy on its head is, oh, yeah, rates are way too high, and high rates are making housing prices go up. And I guess she just means housing costs in terms of uh, in terms of you now have to pay more for interest rates. 
But that's only because, in my opinion, the housing prices haven't responded yet to the new reality of interest rates. I don't know. You, I've already kind of expressed my analysis uh, you know, in what I think is this totally half-baked letter. But I mean, what do you what do you think, though, of this in terms of, in political terms? Right. I mean, what is does this letter reflect, you think, overall feeling in the Congress or is this just some posturing by Warren because of all of her financial regulation work in the past? I don't know. Where does this letter come out of? Like, what's where? Why did she sit down and have someone write this? Uh, what does she think it's going to accomplish? Well, Elizabeth Warren for years now has enjoyed utilizing Fed hearings and things like that as you know trying to be the, the tough on Fed senator though in the worst ways possible. And this this, this letter, is, I think, is a good example of it. Again, I'm, I'm also entertained that, you know, all of the pearl clutching about, uh, you know, challenging the independence of the Fed, um, you know, that, 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 that those conversations don't come up really when Elizabeth Warren and, uh, you know, when, when Democrats are badgering it, it's only when, you know, Ron Paul wants to out of the Fed and things like that, where, you know, this, this whole veil of uh, we can't, we can't infringe upon Fed independence um, kind of pops up there. Uh, but I, I think it is reflecting, you know, just, the, I think there is a lot of anxiety within the the political class about the consequences of the medicine of, of the Fed's medicine to the inflationary problems that you know everyone involved is culpable for. Um, you know, I, I do know. You know, I think that there is a very real you know the the extent to which you know it, it is interesting because again for 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 months now, right the the talking points from Democrats is about how great the economy is, how great the economy is, how great the economy is. And Biden economics is working, right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now they are they are adjusting that script and they want to to highlight the Fed as the the reason why all these great Biden policies are not panning out because it's it's the Fed and their their egregiously high interest rates, which again still low relative to historical standards, that that is the the reason for all of their problems. And so the stuff that is being reflected in the real economy, I'm, you know, I'm here in, in Florida, I've had a conversation with someone who has a marine uh, dealership who was talking about how low the, uh, how, you know, how people are putting off boat maintenance, how people are um, not, uh, how, how little fuel is being pumped out right now because people aren't using their boats because of the cost of it. And, you know, these, these are, you know, I think they're, they're finally waking up to the extent that Main Street is really hurting. Um from the situation going on. But of course, the main driver of that is the extent to which infl you know, inflation is so baked in now. I mean, you know, year after year after year, after, you know, four or 5% of level inflation is, is hurting things. So the idea is like, oh, well, yeah, the, the, the solution is just cutting rates and everything's going to be hunky dory. Um, it's, it's absurd, but it's exactly the sort of, of you know, it's, it's perfectly on brand for Warren's style of kind of faux progressive politics is trying to use kind of working class conditions to advocate for policies that inevitably will benefit first and foremost, the people that are highly invested in financial assets and the like. So she gets to take on this, this bad cop demeanor that built, she built her career on while still doing the bidding for the patron class that uh, benefits so many of her and her colleagues in, in Washington. So Mark, is she right? Is, is the fact that letting interest rates rise slightly to 5.5%. It hasn't, it hasn't addressed the cost of living issue. So is the, the answer now to cut rates and that'll make everything fine again? No, I think those right. Uh, <laughs> this is a political ploy, uh, obviously. Um, and it's not just senators Warren and Rosen, all politicians who are up for reelection right now, if you ask their opinion, they would definitely say they want uh, lower interest rates. They want lower mortgage rates. They want uh, lower borrowing costs for business, you know, right across the board, because that serves uh, such a large constituent groups uh, that they have to win the votes for. So, yes, I mean, uh, you know, we're looking, Austrians typically are looking at the bigger picture, but when the Fed manipulates rates have they, as they have done, dri first driving them down to ridiculously low levels and then having to raise them to try to shut down the inflationary price process, uh, you're going to cause all sorts of microeconomic problems 
And we're seeing that in uh, residential real estate where a lot of people are holding on to their homes because of the low mortgages they got a few years ago. So there are higher prices than they otherwise would be. So it's messing up the uh, mortgage market. And the commercial real estate people are saying the same thing when they have to refinance their projects. Uh, they're fa they're uh, facing much higher borrowing costs at the same time that they have fewer tenants and lower leasing rates. Uh, so, yeah, there's tons of these microeconomic problems out there that the Fed is causing in addition to the business cycle and price inflation and, uh, uh, you know, income redistribution in the economy. There's all sorts of these microeconomic problems. And it just really tells us even more why we have to fight against the Fed and all of the things that the Fed can mess up and exactly why we need to have a return to a system where money, credit, interest rates are all determined in the marketplace uh, rather than by some government bureaucracy that is uh, looking at the economy, looking at the stock market, looking at the political process and, and the, the election cycle. Uh, we need something that's independent, uh, that's objective, and only the market brings that to us. Uh, and by the way, that's a great reason uh, why everybody should be reading Murray Rothbard's uh, little teeny book called What Has Government Done to Our Money? Uh, because he explains it all uh, so beautifully and succinctly. Um, I can't recommend that book highly enough. Now, I've got one prediction. If the Fed does not come out um, and, and signal that you know, one or two rate cuts is possible prior to the election, you're going to start seeing headlines about how Jay Powell is fueling right-wing extremism through his intransigence on Fed policy. Because within the letter, right, he's like, oh, well, your Europe is now cutting rates. Obviously, we've, we've seen the political fallout there. I, you, I, I bet you that is the next, that is the next strategy from the Beltway is that if Powell does not say, is not does not start acting the way that politicians like Warren wants them to, connecting the Fed policy to right wing extremism will be the next play to try to to, to beat them over the head with it. Well, it would be weird given the, all the other things they are willing to say and all the other people they are willing to demonize that they would somehow stop with the Fed. I mean, <laughs> once the Fed becomes inconvenient to them, then sure, then it's the enemy, at least until they get someone inside more to their liking. Well, thank you, gents, for joining me today and uh, just giving this uh, this economic update. And yeah, we don't know what's going to happen next with the Fed, but uh, we'll know the next time they meet. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, thank you to Mark for taking time out from uh, Rothbard Graduate Seminar, which is going on this week. And uh, that's where we bring together some of our top scholars, some of our graduate students to do some more in-depth analysis of uh, authors like Mises, Rothbard, some of the key texts there. And this is one of our lesser known programs, but certainly one of the more intense and uh, most uh, important programs in that it really helps train up the next generation of uh, faculty members, graduate students, scholars, the people actually writing the books 20 years from now are people who are attending Rothbard Graduate Seminar now. So thank you, Mark, for uh, uh, ducking out of that for just a few minutes to join us here today. Thank yeah, you. And so I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, on air Miss Alice Lilly, who's been helping to finance the Rothbard Graduate Seminar for the last 25 years. And it's an amazing program. I just can't tell you how great it is to see young faces digging into the hardcore um, Austrian material. This year, we're going through Mises's Human Action in its uh, the 75th anniversary of its publication. Uh, and they are absolutely loving it. And we're having a great discussion and great lectures down there. And we're one of the few true great book seminars out there in that tradition. So I'm glad. Glad that we have that here in Auburn. 
Well, thank you everyone for listening to this episode of Radio Rothbard. We will be back next week with another episode, so we'll see you next time. 